<laughs> so let me welcome people here. Um, I think that we are live now. Um, I'm live here on Talk Time with uh, Dr. Stephen Porges, and I'm very happy to be here and to have you here as um, our guest today, um, Dr. Porges, talking about your book and other things related to our our biology and our physiology and emotion and attachment, which are all things I know that you um, have a lot to do with. So let me just introduce you a little bit to people who may not be as familiar with your work because you've um, contributed so much to the field. And you're a professor of psychiatry now at the University of North Carolina where you have a lab, which I'll like to hear a little bit about um, that. And moving there from the University of Illinois Chicago where you were directing the Brain Body Center and um, have been at a couple other universities too and contributed so much along the way and now in North Carolina where I just think of it as warm and beautiful um, having visited there but you've published so many so much so much scientific so many scientific papers across several disciplines and uh, it's all very interesting. We are largely probably therapists that are that you're talking to today, um, so we don't have the same kind of um, background in uh, in medical background, medicine and neurology and physiology as you do. So that's also why it's very exciting to us to be learning more about it and what uh, what your theory has to say because many times we're also working with emotion dysregulation and emotion and trauma and those sorts of things which you uh, have contributed so much to with your polyvagal theory so welcome <clears throat> thank you Becca it's a pleasure to be here and you know, really enjoy interacting with the clinical world because that's how I'm informed about what the real problems in life are about so as a scientist you know, we tend to be much more theoretical and we tend not to really see what's going on in the world but meeting therapists, I'm always continually informed. Yeah. And therapists have taken so well to your work, really, with um, around polyvagal theory. I know you present to scientific communities, uh, physician communities as well, but many, lots of times you're also talking to therapists, aren't you? I, I'm talking to very different groups. It's really kind of a wonderful opportunity. Talking a lot to the trauma community, a lot of uh, a lot of meetings around the world talking about trauma and also dealing with development and individual differences but I still get invited to do grand rounds at universities and neuroscience programs so it's like straddling two worlds but it's a really a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just uh, let our audience know a little bit about you maybe you could tell us a little bit about your lab and what you're doing now I'm at UNC. Well, those are always tough questions because when I start talking, I start uh, actually I, I'm get a little embarrassed. Not because I'm embarrassed about what I do, but because I do things on many different levels. So it's from my perspective, it's all the same. But when you start talking about it, people say, "Well, you're doing this, you're doing that, all these various things." My lab, actually, at the University of North Carolina, is actually focused on technologies. So it's a uh, and actually it's something that clinicians would actually love because we're developing non-contact measures of physiology so that we're developing uh, techniques to point video cameras at people and study their heart rate patterns and study the vagal regulation of their heart from a distance wow. so I mean, couples therapists are very excited about this possibility <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah therapists of all sorts and couple yeah. therapists to be able to see see that um, what's happening there when we really need to slow things down to kind of get safety back in the room. Exactly, because what the polyvagal theory gives you as a clinician is a validation of your intuitions. And that is you see the physiology of the client of the person on their face and in their voice. And so those in a sense are non-contact assessments as well. So we're developing technologies that actually measure physiology with a video camera and we also are extracting uh, physiological indices from the prosodic features of human voice. The human voice is so important and that's been a real basis of um, your polyvagal theory around that so I'm, I'm happy for us to go there and to talk about that. But So you've been at the lab 
just for a few years, but it sounds like you have some really fantastic projects happening oh, there. Really enjoying them. And we're also doing two clinical trials, so now you start seeing the other flip of the side. We're, we're doing two clinical trials on an acoustic intervention to reduce auditory hypersensitivities. And this gets, again, a little bit more esoteric in the physiology. But when you listen to prosodic voices, calming, melodic voices like mothers, it's actually triggering in the brain a sense of safety and relaxation. And we're actually developed interventions that amplify those prosodic features. But we're also testing technology. So now you start seeing these things together because uh, we developed a device that measures the transfer function of the middle ear structures. Now, this may sound a little bit way out there, but if the middle ear structures don't work, meaning if they don't contract in, when you're in a safe environment, you're not going to hear the ends of words. You're not going to hear the consonants. So you're going to misinterpret what people are saying. And that's because our nervous system, when it detects uh, danger, removes the control of the middle ear, and we can hear low-frequency uh, predator sounds, but we can't hear the ends of words of sentences. So now you know why people, when well, you have the couples together and they're, yes. arguing, they're not hearing what each other saying. How saying. much they lose that really there is this biological mechanism right. happening that they can't, they really can't hear each other. No, they can't hear each other and uh, what happens is they start reinforcing their physiological state. They're, they're basically mobilizing and responding to each other as if they're predators. They're being defensive in psychological terms. So we have a clinical trial in Australia and we're starting one in Los Angeles on this project. So um, those are kind of the fun things we're doing. That's really fun. That, that really kind of brings you full circle yeah. from the voice. Uh, you've right. talk, you talk so much about, about the voice and then to look at the other side of the receptivity Mm -hmm. um, and what's happening inside the ear, that's so fascinating. Well, they're so wired together so that if you are vocalizing with prosodic intonation, the feedback to your nervous system is to tighten those middle ear muscles and to stimulate the orbicularis oculi, the, uh, the orbital muscle around the eye. Again, as a good therapist or a good spouse or a good partner, what do you look at? You look at the upper part of the face. Mm -hmm. Because that... Uh, muscle regulates, uh, the nerve that regulates this muscle also regulates the middle ear. But the vocalizations, when they're prosodic, are being regulated by a pathway of the vagus, just like the heart. So we, we not only wear our heart on our face, we project our heart in our voice. So, wow. So, you know, everything that people have talked about in terms of intuitions have a clear neurobiology behind that. Well, the other thing that occurs to me as you say that is not only intuitions, but the things that, that we're observing as far as nonverbals. And mm -hmm. we've talked so much about nonverbal being important, but to really link it up as to why it's important, what it's communicating, mm -hmm. and then see the physiology behind that's really fascinating. There's also another layer. And so it's not merely verbal versus or contrasting with nonverbal. It's syntax versus the emotionality of the voice, syntax mm. versus prosody. Syntax doesn't work. You know, you, you, arguments don't yes. work. But intonation works. You can calm, you can soothe. The prototypical ex example is the crying baby who's soothed by a very competent mother who doesn't yell at the baby to stop crying, but uses her voice to calm the baby. Mm, right. So that's why we can just vocalize in some warm, kind of melodic sort of a way and say, oh, gooby da ba la ba do ba do and, and that can make a difference. Well, I used to have, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a grad student, let me go back really far, I had a roommate who had such a smile and prosodic voice, he could say anything to anyone, including very crude and rough things, and people would just smile back. <laughs> it, so it really told you the weights of the importance of prosody. They were actually picking up the affect, which was very positive, and they were, in a sense, neglecting or desiring not to process the crude things he was saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It made it much easier to ignore those crude things when Absolutely. he delivered it I, in the way he I, did. I used to say, if I said anything like that, I wouldn't survive. So. <laughs> um, 
So let's let's go to the theory, uh, the polyvagal theory, and maybe you can just unpack that a little <laughs> bit for us, knowing you know okay. how little, got, how so elementary got, you may need to be for us. So I got to stretch and move on that one because the theory is. Uh, uh, I'm actually trying to write a readable paper, or let's use terms, the beginning of a readable book. And for clinicians, it, I think, yes. Uh, for human beings. For That's humans, right. yeah. Um, the problem with scientists is that they write for the 10 people that work in their area, and they hope those 10 people will read it, but no one else will understand it. Um, the theory uses evolution as the primary organizing principle. So let's just start there. And it uses a, a word or construct called phylogeny, which is our evolutionary history. So we want to know about human evolutionary history. We want to know about mammals. We are a mammal. And we want to know that mammals uh, transitioned in evolution from an ancient type of reptile. And that ancient type of reptile looks something like a turtle. Mm -hmm. So that turtle had very interesting defense strategies which were immobilization. Yes. Moving so the right first in. thing is when we focus on the transition from reptiles to mammals, that is the story of the polyvagal theory because with the transition from reptiles to mammals, we got a second vagal pathway. We didn't thus, merely uh, vagus, So this is thus the poly poly vagus. part of of the vagus, right? That right, there's right. It's two poly. pathways related to it. Right. Right. So we have a more ancient one that we share with many vertebrates, including the reptiles. And that, for us, is the uh, vagal pathways within the same nerve that go to organs below our diaphragm. So you'll notice that with many of your clients, they have gut problems. Mm -hmm. They have pelvic floor issues. They have digestive issues. They have fibromyalgia, which we'll get to in a moment. They have irritable bowel syndrome. These start sounding like things that clinicians hear. This I is was... Um I, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. that so many times when we're with clients and I was watching a video today of Sue Johnson working with mm -hmm. a couple and she slowed the the gentleman down mm -hmm. so that he could see what was going on, you know, what he was feeling internally and he described this band ah. you know, right uh, around his ribs, sort of this kind of heavy band. Ah. Um, which his diaphragm. Yes, that's and right. What you see with lots of people is that the diaphragm gets frozen. Right. And if you have abdominal surgery, the diaphragm will get frozen. But coming back to the theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we share with other vertebrates this vagal pathway that goes subdiaphragmatically. But we also have a newer vagal pathway that is unique to mammals. And that regulates in us organs above the diaphragm regulates our heart. But the most important part is that not only does it regulate those organs, but in our brainstem, it's integrated with the regulation of the striate muscles of the face. Mm -hmm. So we wear our heart on our face, we project our heart with our voice, uh, our ears open up when we are in a heartfelt place, they close, meaning we can't hear voice when we're under predator stress. Mm -hmm. So all these dynamics of social interaction, or what I now use the term co-regulation, are that where an individ two individuals are using each other to regulate physiology, yes. are mammalian innovations. Yes, so we, have yes to we love that term, co-regulation. That's certainly what many times we're trying to do as partners, as therapists, mm -hmm. is to be in there with someone when they're having a difficult time and help them Mm -hmm. uh, regulate. So that's kind of bring it out of danger, the danger zone, I guess, back into safety. But, but think for a moment and think that the major role of an interaction is to co-regulate a biobehavioral state. Mm -hmm. And we see this with babies you know, when they're born. So unlike reptile infants who are hatch out of their shells by their own and then scamper off and try to survive, when the human baby, when the mammalian baby is born, it needs nurturance. So we see this interaction occurring, and we see it's not merely caregiving. I really d don't like the word caregiving because mm -hmm. it implies a unidirection. So healthy relationships, even between mother and infant, have a reciprocity to them. Mm -hmm. So the co-regulation has features of reciprocity. 
Yes, and so and interesting about human human babies, we I think our babies are the most dependent, the longest than other mammals. So that is so important that we are able to develop yeah. that reciprocity. But interestingly, you know, our culture likes to say, well, you need to take care of yourself. You need to be, you know, we do all these things. But we have to really go back to our own, um, in a sense, neurobiological history. And that is mammals need other mammals. We need to be around others. And that the two worst things for a mammal are one, isolation, and the other one is restraint. Now, if we translate that into clinical features, they become triggers <clears throat> of trauma events or abuse events. Okay. So, yes, so that isolation and then restraint. So maybe you could give us an example of restraint. Restraint would be the sense uh, in terms of, you know, when people talk about being raped or being physically abused. Yes. They're being restrained, they're so being held down. Really, that loss of control. When I'm supposed to be, as a human, I expect to be an interaction and a co-regulation experience. Yeah. And then I'm either left alone or I'm overpowered. Yeah. So I even move it out of the expectancy view, and I talk about neural expectancy. Yeah. So it's not even my mind is working, I want this. It's that my nervous system anticipates this. And when That's such a good clarification because it's not that I'm thinking about it. It's right. just that it's a precondition that my whole body expects to have. But what happens is when it's violated, your body changes. Mm -hmm. Then you start developing an explanation. But your body's picking up these cues all the time. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the first part was uh, of the theory was that the face and the muscles face and the voice and the ear are linked to the regulation of the heart through a second vagal pathway, thus polyvagal. But the second major think, thought piece is really that the autonomic nervous system is organized hierarchically. Yes. And I so love we, that concept um, about well, the hierarchy that you've developed. I think yeah. that's just so helpful to, uh, for us to understand. So our autonomic nervous system does lots of very important biological functions. And what we have to realize is that it does its best, meaning it regulates homeostasis, serves uh, it's the demands for growth, health, and restoration when we are in safe environments. But here becomes the real issue. We live in a culture that has a very difficult time defining safety. Mm -hmm. So even if we look at demographic research, they're not studying safety. They're studying features of danger. Yeah. So you could extract or you could remove all the features of danger within an environment, but it does not necessarily mean the person will feel safe. That's because our nervous system evolved to receive cues from others that trigger a sense of feeling safe. So okay. just being without cues of danger, unless we actually are receiving cues right. of safety, we won't have a felt sense of being safe. That's correct. We could even play a little thought game, and that is, put yourself in a bomb shelter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't get I, hurt. I don't want right? to go there. Right. It, yeah, it's going to hurt. It's unpleasant. Yeah. Right. Um, what you want are the features of interaction. Now, the other interesting part of this is that our nervous system evolved with an exquisite flexibility to move from fight, flight, and mobilized states to social engaged social states. Mm -hmm. So we can run and we could fight and then if a person looked at us and spoke ni nicely to us, we'd calm down. Yes. So that is the first part of that hierarchy, and that is this new vagal circuit can functionally downregulate our sympathetics of fight, 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 flight. So we watch this with a baby. A baby's in tantrum. How does the mother calm the baby? She, yeah, she rocks and rocks and and gives all kinds of vocal cues. Cues. So yeah. if we if we go back to that vignette I saw on your web page, <laughs> the couples, and what happens is that initially in the first segments they're becoming very very cognitive. They're talking about in a sense things that are the right to do versus things that aren't. But those cues of doing what they think are right 
those cues do not necessarily make each other feel comfortable and safe. That's right. Not and at all. In fact, I think that's really what the process of the therapeutic model was to, in a sense, stop rationalizing using their, their syntax and their cognitive structures, but to become more aware of their emotions and to understand how the emotions affect each other. Yes, that's right. That's right. To calm everything down so we can see what is going on internally and they can send new cues of and get some reciprocity going so it is safer. Yes. Okay. So the hierarchy is that when this social system, the neural regulation of the face works, it functionally calms the heart down mm -hmm. and down regulates sympathetic defense systems. Now let's uh, suppose that that doesn't work. And, the, and now you're in danger because the person is really in rage. Yeah. Okay. And so you now can flee. But what if you can't get out of there? Yes. So the nervous system has two options. One is to fight and tense up. The other is to shut down. Yeah. And so this is that old reptilian defense system of, if it's not a cognitive one, but basically the reptile is immobilizing in defense and in a sense, trying to become inanimate, not there. Yeah, right. Now, as that gets translated into humans, we start seeing uh, dissociative states. We start seeing people passing out, people literally leaving their bodies. Now, that the physiology of that happens to be also vagal. So we have vagal as being this very, very positive with the face and all this protective bit. But then we have this very ancient system that is also vagal. Yeah. To me, that's actually how the theory evolved because it was a paradox. How could the vagus protect you and also functionally kill you? Yes, and because if it if it shuts down too far, that's a big risk. And uh, and you were looking at heart rates in babies, I think, yeah, and yeah. you were notice you were seeing how protective that ancient system was. But well, what I was seeing was that that ancient system only came in when the new system wasn't functioning. Ah. Uh, Yes. So when you're dealing with term babies or healthier preterms, they were having this newer mammalian vagal circuit was there producing a very rhythmic heart rate. But when that was gone, then the babies had higher heart rates, but they also were prone to massive bradycardias. Mm -hmm. and being the heart rate slows up, the baby can become hypoxic. And that created to be a paradox. How could the vagus both be good and bad? Well, it wasn't a paradox. It was a different system in the same nerve. So it was different right. pathways that were going down the same nerve. Right. That's that right. really became the theory. And what the theory enabled the articulation of this hierarchy from a social engagement, protective vagal system that downregulated defense to the uh, sympathetic that mobilized you. And then when that didn't work, even a more primitive defense system of shutting down. Yeah. Now, now, I'm going to tell you, there's another hierarchy involved here, and that is you find out that many people who have had restraint or traumatized histories yes. do high-risk behaviors and are you know, highly anxious and try to stay mobilized. Yeah. There's an adaptive function there, and that is as long as they keep moving, they can't shut down. Yeah, so that's so interesting, right, yeah. that all that anxiety... Mm -hmm. uh, and people, it's also what I think is so interesting, of course, in, in the clinical work is as I learn more about the physiology and the brain and these mm -hmm. kinds of things, to hear people try to articulate what their felt experience is and how close they are, you know, to really what's going on without yeah. understanding. Like they'll say, well, if I keep moving, if mm -hmm. I don't keep moving, I just like fall into this dark I'll pit. Disappear. You know? I'll fall yeah. to a void. I'll die. Yes. And so that's why we'd be very careful in terms of providing advice <laughs> because we may, we tend to see it always from our own perspective. And if we're in a sense a well regulated person, we would say, Why are you so anxious? Just sit still. Mm -hmm. you know, stop moving around. We're not understanding that that person has really very, very basic problems uh, that is that in their body immobilization is just a bad place to be. Yes, and so this, um, you probably will have to set me a little clear on this, because it seems like that, um, you know, some, some people, this initial 
hierarchy of of health protection and health and that we're kind of made to move and you know grow have a healthy yeah. have healthy relationships reciprocity move and that when we have all of that we do we grow and we develop and though it seems like some folks who have had trauma particularly um, interpersonal trauma and difficulty may like skip part of the hierarchy <laughs> or you know yeah. go go into uh, maybe shut down without moving right. can, can it just like skip past the fight flight and straight mm -hmm. into well they may be in a fight flight you may not notice it and they just go in it just goes so fast yeah, so they may be tightly wrapped or they may be yeah. you know, uh, they, they may not have the resilience but if they have this strong social engagement system, which is the word I use to describe the neuroregulation of the face and head, those muscles, and the linkage with that new vagal system, yeah, and that system is there. It provides tremendous resilience. So I actually started to structure what I call the polyvagal syndrome, which basically um, removes different layers of the system and then tells you what the symptoms would be. Ah. Okay. And mm -hmm. It's when you get to the immobilization as defense that you start seeing lots and lots of health disorders. And they tend to be sub diaphragmatic disorders. Lots of gut, lots of irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, blood pressure regulation. Lots of very, very basic biological systems start not working in their optimal way. So if I'm someone that has to use immobilization because of all the danger cues that I'm picking up mm -hmm. and the absence of safety cues that that's really a big wear and tear on my body and mm -hmm. then you start to see these sorts of symptoms when I'm really having to immobilize a lot or those yeah. pathways have really been developed there's like so much um, unsafety in my world perhaps yeah link to that one can think that if you've suffered from severe trauma and that has become your major defense is just shutting down. Right. What you really have is an accelerated aging resulting in the manifestation of many of the chronic diseases of aging. They just get there earlier. Mm. Right. Because they're part of what you're describing is a dysfunction of autonomic regulation. And most of the chronic diseases that we have are dysfunction of autonomic regulation. And it's all such an adaptive way that the body's trying to maintain some sense of safety because there's been too much danger the, in the world. The body's trying to negotiate with whatever resource it has. Uh -huh. And with the love, um, Jim Cohen would say, at least about the neuro energy, with the most efficiency, most efficient way possible as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the efficient one actually is when you get the social engagement system working with them with this new mammalian vagus, it reduces a lot of the metabolic output of that mobilization circuit and then enables the sympathetic nervous system not to be a defense system for fight flight, but to literally dance with that old vagal system to create homeostasis in your body. So those systems, the issue is the autonomic nervous system is not just sitting there to be a defense system. The danger is when the autonomic nervous system is recruited for defense. So we have because, to visualize Yes, it because optimally it's, it would only be used rarely, that it's there as this, this right. to be used in a backup for danger, but not to be uh, kind of on the front. Right, and we have to distinguish between mobilization and fight flight. Mm. So the, it's the difference between play and fighting. And play, if you watch animals play, what you see is that they're always making face-to-face -face contact. They're always social referencing each other, they're cueing each other. So if you watch kittens play or dogs play, they'll chase each other, they'll do a little bite, but they'll turn their head to social reference to make sure that the intention, the biological intention, is not to injure. So it's the face-to-face -face is giving a cue. And when the intention is not to injure, you get a role reversal. So play has a lot of things that you know relationships should have. Yes. Reciprocity, role reversal, and they should also be in, in uh, 
uh, at the same time. They should not be asynchronous, meaning good relationships are not made or based on email. Okay? <laughs> right. It happens in real time. <laughs> real time is important because of the reciprocity issue. It's not that these other forms aren't useful, yes. but it, interacting in real time is really what our nervous system evolved to anticipate. Yeah, it's got, so that part is so important. And I think you have a little term about um, exercise, about, mm -hmm. and maybe you want to talk to us just okay. a, just a little bit about, was it neuro exercise that you, you got said? it, yes. So social behavior to me is a neural exercise. Yes. And I think the educational institutions have it all wrong. So what they've done in the school systems is that they remove recess, all the social interactional components to provide more time for cognitive skill building. And what they miss is the fact that the neural exercises of social behavior provide the resilience to regulate state under challenges. So if you had good neural exercise of reciprocity and interacting, you could sit still and process information. Mm -hmm. So we miss that opportunity. So I see play as a neural exercise. I see social interaction even talking to you is a mm -hmm. neural exercise. Right. So the more that having that engagement mm -hmm. that is the cue coming to us that says you're safe, you're mm -hmm. important, and having that reciprocity going is yeah. such an important baseline for us to grow and learn and able to use our cognitions in, in other ways. It's really interesting because as you were talking, I was starting to think about my discussions with many people in the clinical world and that is the notion of being witnessed or people hearing you listening mm -hmm. uh, is very very critical uh, listening without interpreting listening valid not changing but it says witnessing that this has happened is extremely powerful because it's part of a reciprocity listening is a reciprocal behavior yeah. so if I if as I'm there that reciprocity sends those cues mm -hmm. and that gives me a status of well-being yeah. which frees up me to do so that leads uh, right into attachment theory really right which yeah, leads well, me to explore and play and feel well, safe in the world you just slid into a wonderful subject <laughs> because when you are in these wonderful states of feeling safe you have access to different parts of your brain that you wouldn't have had if you're scared and mobilized yeah. Because uh, then your parasympathetic nervous system isn't involved on that alert, and it can be being used for the homeostasis. And right, right. So everything is working, and if your body feels safe, you're, you have the ability to be more creative and bolder. See, that part I love is the notion that we try to scare people in, into trying to solve problems, as opposed to engaging them to be more secure so that they can be bolder and try unusual solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's a nice way. I hadn't heard that, thought about it that way before, about, you know, Bowlby, John Bowlby would talk about that safe haven and secure base, but that secure base to go out does give you, when you have that security, you can go out with more boldness. You right. take, a more take, sense of who you are as well. Well, even even taking all these uh, in a sense psychological metaphors and say, I have this exercise I've done, and that exercise of social interacting uh, has so predictable that I know that I can calm down, mm -hmm. or I can be calmed. Yes, you know, that recognition enables me or any child to explore more knowing that they can come back to that secure base and be regulated. So the exploration and you know things become internalized, we develop our own mental maps or mental models, but initially we're all dealing with a neural exercise of having another help us regulate our state. Yeah. So as I, as I experience fear or threat to go back and have that reciprocity, that mm -hmm. safe safety reestablished then develops that security, that boldness yeah. to not be so frightened about my own, uh, I guess that own, the way that I might become immobilized and how frightening I, that is to it, face that. You know, so if you ask people what is the most frightening thing to them, 
what is the worst thing that they can't even speak about? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you finally get them to speak about it. It's, it's always going to be one thing. So um, I had a, a friend who was a psychiatrist who made me promise that if he died, he wouldn't be blank, blank. Like he wouldn't be cremated? Buried, he wouldn't be buried alive. <laughs> oh, buried alive. <laughs> Okay. Because so if they thought he he was so fearful of that, oh, it, okay. and in fact a lot of if you think about this notion of buried alive, uh, a, the locked out syndrome where you're totally paralyzed and you can't yes. move anything, um, and it, all these are real. They're metaphors of this isolation and lack of control, but they're really part of what mammals can't deal with. Mammals need to move. They don't like to be helped. So if you went into a pet store and picked up an animal that you didn't know or was afraid and, and held it, it would try to get away. Yeah, wants to if get you, down and move. It wants to move. But when you have someone who's comfortable with you, like your own child or your spouse or your very close friend, the hugs can form and yeah. you have the ability to immobilize without fear. And I think the critical feature of human civilization or human evolution has been this ability to create structures in which we can immobilize without fear. I think it's the driving force of civilization, meaning we sleep in rooms with walls and doors. We also eat in rooms with walls. Whenever we're dealing with our bodily processes, we have to give up vigilance. Mm -hmm. And and that vigilance interferes with those bodily processes because the bodily processes need us to immobilize without fear. Right. So, okay, let's just let's just review that real quickly because that you said so many important things. Um, when we feel safe, and we're looking, I'm still stuck a little bit on your locked in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you see, idea, right? I told you, uh, it, 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 but I can get people out of it. Have you seen? Yeah, killing? no. What, what what stuck me is I think I was um, feeling a little bit embarrassed about talking about cremation because I was already imagining the person dead, right? Yeah, I, so, I didn't. I didn't um, give you the right cues. But that's okay. So that idea about then how vulnerable so I'm thinking then about this vulnerability that we carry around with us and you you know moved from that uh, final resting place yeah. if I will into the bedroom and mm. how important it is that we are always looking for that safety really and then to be able to have safety in the arms of another yeah. it, but it's also you're right there on the edge of well, I'm here and safe, but I could also be restrained. In that, right, in restrained, that place. not restrained, but held. 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 Yeah. Supported. Supported. So, yes, but it is. It's that. It is uh, the same physical act. Yes. In context. Right. So I just wrote a little paper with uh, Eric Pepper. I don't know if you know Eric Pepper. I He's guess. in San Diego State. Um, and it was uh, the statement. The pa little paper was when saying no, when not saying no is not saying yes. Yes. And this has to do with date rape. And it was all about what happens if you're so fearful that you immobilize and can't articulate. Yes. Which happens so. Yes. Happens so frequently. Yes. And this is really where the polyvagal theory comes in to explain you lose, con you can't speak. Yeah. And and the systems stop. So the the issue is we're in such a cognitive world that demands syntax, words for communication. It doesn't have enough, it's not informed enough about what happens to bodies under different situations. So that immobilization state or that shutdown state is really kind of the bodies. If we knew more about it, we are more aware as a general public. That's the body's way of screaming out, danger, stop. Well, beyond that, it's like saying, I think I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Even, yeah. It's not even danger. Yeah. Danger, in general, we say, I'm going to run away or I'm going to fight. Thank you for but, that. That's right. But when we, when we don't have that option, 
to get out, our body can sometimes go into this immobilization. Let me give you the, the best metaphor is the, rat, the mouse in the jaws of a cat. Okay. Where, where people say, oh, the mouse is playing dead. Well, the mouse didn't say, hey, I want to survive, I'll play dead. <laughs> it's such a fun game, playing dead. <laughs> had no option. Yes. Because there are no opportunities to fight or to flee. But what most people don't realize is that when that mouse went into that physiological state of being totally limp and functionally passed out, they could die from that state. There's a risk because they're not getting enough oxygen, oxygenated blood to their brains. Yeah, so even being in that state is a very, is a very threatening uh, experience. Right. Yeah. We evolved, and this is where evolution is so powerful in informing us about our own experiences. We evolved as mammals not to easily go into that state and not to easily recover from it. It's not the state, it's not a preferred state. Yeah. Our preferred state is literally fight, flight, and then love. You know, basically run, you know, <laughs> it's basically neurotic behavior and then loving behavior is part of humanity. But it's this shutting down bit where people are distant and where the cues of social engagement can often now be a threat to them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, um, that, so it's like beyond threat, really, you know, it's beyond yeah. danger. It's kind of the sense of certain death or yeah. um, beyond pain, beyond fear, beyond what you can cope with, really. Impending doom, okay, this yeah. is, uh, this is, I call it life threat, and to try to distinguish it from danger, it's somehow my body says, this is it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm gone. That's literally what the body is saying. It's not a cognitive decision. It's what the body's doing. Yes. It's giving up. And so we see that uh, clinically that shows up like in dissociate, dissociation, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or well, it's been beyond pain. It's been it's too much to handle. And then that, that's part of that shutdown. So what I, I want to bring in a little point. See, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a clinician. And so the impact of these ideas on clinical practice were somewhat of a surprise to me. And since I was informed by the clinical community when they started to hear about these processes that it helped explain a lot of the clinical features. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very interesting personal journey for me. So the journey really was, oh, I'm, I do this work in the laboratory, I build these models, I study kids, I study adults, I do animal research, I build gadgets. But now here's this theory. And so I tell this theory, and actually the, the big effect for me was I talked at a meeting, oh, it's in the 90s, I guess late 90s, uh, the Bessel van der Kolk ran uh -huh. on trauma. And I lay out the theory, I talk about it, and I talk about the treatment I was doing then with autistic kids to make them more sociable by giving them acoustic stimulation. I finished this talk, and I get a standing ovation. I mean, we all like standing ovations, but <laughs> I didn't know even why I was on the program. You know, it was like I didn't <laughs> understand this, and things like this happened repeatedly. I talked at a at a, at a various conferences, and the ideas start were very central to the different therapeutic models, including group psychotherapy, including studying borderline, studying bipolar, uh, autism. All these features can be seen in various manifestations in different clinical disorders and even in the spectrum of normal behavior. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's so helpful in the therapeutic world and I imagine, you know, I'm glad that you're working on that book for the general public too, to have this understanding that maybe helps us get out of our heads and our cognitions and get back to contact a little bit more and understand what you know, it, maybe we feel safer as we understand things. I think we all do because I think part of the problem with mental illness or mental health issues is we tend not to understand them. Yeah. And and that 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 creates in our mind a lack of predictability. And I have received wonderful emails from patients, from therapists around the world, who have read some of my materials and used it to reframe their own personal narrative. Mm -hmm. I thought was just just brilliant and wonderful. Yeah. About, so one woman had been raped and almost strangled 
and when she was 18 and she's now in her late 60s and she was telling her daughter and her daughter made her feel so ashamed that she didn't fight the attacker off <laughs> and I think this happens to a lot of people they feel ashamed then she said I read your theory and I start understanding about how the body immobilizes and she said I feel so vindicated <sighs> I'm crying now and it was it was so uh, you know uh, giving and understanding so she was able to shift her narrative from victim to heroic so yeah. her body helped her saved her she wasn't injured yes and the problem is we think that it's our responsibility to fight off and to win those battles mm -hmm. and understand that we have other defense systems that at times can be very helpful that are very adaptive but they may have difficulty in a sense normalizing back to our social cells mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that normalization back to social self, when we've had that trauma, when, when there hasn't been reciprocity and there's been worse, there's been that trauma that makes it very difficult to receive the safety cues and trust yeah. them. Well, I, I think that is, I mean, you're, you're, that's the critical point. So what portal do you use? Mm -hmm. okay, this is really where I've been working and thinking about. And I think the portal happens to be acoustic. Yeah. Uh, it's because our nervous system takes this prosodic features in an unambiguous way. It doesn't take language. Language can be ambiguous. Facial expressivity can be ambiguous. Gesture can. But the body seems to know about prosody. It really does. And I will tell you something else. Uh, we've done some research mm -hmm. with babies and also with little prairie voles, and both of them, under stressful situations, will vocalize. Uh -huh. But the features of their vocalizations that are related to heart rate are identical. So they are using vocalizations to cue to the conspecific, their own species, mm -hmm. whether they're safe to come close to. So if we think about therapy, and we think about couples and relationships, mother infants or partners, the power and the importance of the prosodic features of voice in cueing the other person that the physiology of the person vocalizing is safe to come close to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so fascinating that that so you would say that of all of the not kind of the nonverbal things. Mm -hmm that having those, the prosody in the voice, the, those warm intonations, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what we're saying, that that really is going to be the, the cue that's received the easiest, especially from someone who's had a lot of danger coming at them uh, from other people. That's, that's what I believe, yes. Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. It reminds me of um, in therapy, often find myself, you know, kind of leaning forward. I know to use warmth, you know. I well, did a training work, last month on using yeah. warmth, you know, and and trying to smile, be mm. like be there with mm. people in a warm and engaging way, using the nice facial gesture tones and those yeah. kinds of cues. But I also sometimes notice in therapy, and it's probably because I've watched Sue Johnson and she does it, saying, going like, mm, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm, mm, you know, like kind of making little cooing noises in the background. Wow. So when I, I came up with a word that I call neuroception. Oh. <laughs> and neuroception is literally the body's, uh, the nervous system's mm. ability to evaluate risk in the environment without awareness. And so it's picking right. up those intonations, those cues, those gestures. So I'll give you an example of what happened. A couple examples happened to me. Okay. Many years ago, I was talking at Columbia. I was doing uh, at Grand Rounds. This is in the 80s. And someone in the back row was nodding when I was talking. Okay, uh -huh. So you talk about Sue nodding. Uh -huh. And I'm enthusiastic. I orient my talk. I'm leaning. I'm talking to the person in the back row who's nodding. <laughs> and when I finished talking, he continued to nod. It was a tick. Oh, but my nervous system wanted that so badly, that that reciprocity, that engagement. Yes. So uh, it, it, we naturally go there, right? We naturally. I, yes. It, as yes. you say that, I'm imagining myself 
remembering lots of times I've been in front of front of hundreds, yeah. you know, crowds, thousands of people, and and we, somehow when we're scanning, we just notice it, those places where we're getting some feedback from. We're getting, yeah. I, I was giving a talk at a compassion conference a couple of years ago, and they turned the house lights off, <laughs> and I said, "Stop! I can't talk." <laughs> I can't talk. I can't be. I can't have compassion. <laughs> because I needed, I needed to bounce off of the people. I needed that, uh, that feedback. Yeah. To be able to talk, and I think we all need that. That brings it down to such a, you know, basic human level about uh, honoring who we are, what our physiology is, mm -hmm. how our nervous system is set up, and that when we're getting that feedback. Um, our nervous system can not just calm down, but mm -hmm. move into that growth and that, those other functions that you're talking about when it doesn't right. have to be there on alert. It, it heals. It's a, it's a neural exercise. It makes us more, not less. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you another metaphor, and that is neuroception as our own personal TSA agent. So ah. we, we all go to the airport, right? And yes, all I certainly do. Thing. Now, if someone has a trauma history, what does their personal uh, TSA agent say? It says you should screen everyone really no, thoroughly. Keep everyone off the plane. No <laughs> one gets on board. Right. No one gets in. I've learned my lesson. Uh, this is a neurobiology speaking. It's not a cognitive one. The cognitive course is I want to have relationships. I want to, you know, I want to feel good with other people. Yes. But the body is saying, no one gets on board. Right. I've been hurt. I've been tricked. I've been fooled. It's not going to happen again. Yeah. So functionally, neuroception is this modulation of risk, but it's the people who have more of this social engagement system, the myelinate vagus, who can downregulate defense, who will take more risks in life mm -hmm. because they have that resilience. So the tying it back to the neuro exercises, that that really we're helping. As we help develop resilience, that healing can happen because people are less on guard all the time, and that energy can go towards healing, and um, and I guess continue that resilience development. Right, right. So neural, uh, so social behavior, play, uh, these are neural exercises. Yeah. So one of the things that I think I. I'm not sure if I heard you say it or if I read it. I think I probably heard you say it on um, something that I I've, I've been listening, you know, to to you speaking over the years when I've had an opportunity. And I think you've said something about um, the vagus being a feeling, uh, conveying feeling to the brain, something or like 80 percent or I mean, something. Can you help me? Yeah. Okay. Help me. Help me with that. Okay. The vagus is this very, very large nerve. It has these different pathways coming, which I mentioned from two different areas of the brain. Some one uh, is going to be linked with the face, one with organs below the diaphragm. Yep. But those are motor pathways. There's only about 20% of the fibers in the vagus are motor. 80% okay. are sensory. I get They're it. tracking up. And that sensory information may not have the specificity. We, it may change feelings without us knowing what those feelings are. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why there's a lot of interest in like the the biome of the microbiome of the gut, the bacteria, yep. uh, because that is being information about your gut is always being conveyed up the vagus to the brain. So uh. so our just think about gastric distension and your ability to function. You know, if you have cramps or you know you're not a very social person. It's as simple as that. You flood those afferents. You have a stomach ache. You're not worth much. You have mm -hmm. food poisoning. It's all over. Mm -hmm. Because the afferents. So the vagus to me is really the basis of a mind body science and medicine. Yeah. Because of, of the bi directionality of it. Yeah. Now remember, we have come from an academic world, or at least the medical academic world. Yes. We thought so much of, of top down systems mm -hmm. and had very little interest or knowledge about bottom up. 
Yeah. So even in the notion of therapy, a lot of the therapies were more cognitive, not body oriented. Mm -hmm. But now people are seeing that the, the feelings of the body are affecting our ability to think or function. Yeah. And so the vagus literally becomes our metaphor for bidirectionality. Ah, that's beautiful. So one of the ways, I'm just going to make a little inference here, I don't know if it's correct, but it sounds like one of the ways you've applied your theory, your research, understanding the heart and our um, nervous system is that you will say things like at a conference, I need that feedback. Uh, so that some that awareness for you sounds like it's been personally really important to help you uh, move forward and to be. And can we can we uh, speak to that just a moment? Oh, about my personal fit. I, I find it. About how you wonderful. use it. You know, it sounds like you actually do use it. Oh, actively. It's a, it's a wonderful journey because I feel very much a part of the community dealing with trauma and dealing with various you know, psychopathologies. I feel very much part of it mm -hmm. because I've been informed. Listen, I basically have gone to school for about 15 or 20 years of this, traveling uh -huh. and talking and listening. So yeah. often when I'm at meetings, uh, the people who invite me are always surprised that I hang around to listen to the other speakers. Mm -hmm. I said, How would I, you know, when would I learn? How would I learn? Mm -hmm. and so it's the respect for what other people are doing and learning about it and trying desperately to develop a vocabulary to translate these ideas into words that other people can understand. And there are very few, in a sense, I, would, I call myself a laboratory-based scientist, there are very few who step into the world of clinical treatment or get on the circuit giving talks, like mm -hmm. your show. This is a yeah. show. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love to have researchers on because, and academics as well, because it is so important to kind of get it out of the lab into some place that... Or get the field or the clinic into the lab. Yeah. Let the people understand what the problems are so they don't intellectualize it and distance from the true experience of what's going on in the field and start creating. So like the, the area of hyperactivity was being dominated by people who thought that it was just more activity when hyperactivity was a different cluster. Yeah. Of Autism has had the same type problems when people move to animal models. They don't understand the complexity of the features that are going on in the families, in the schools, in the clinics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in our last few minutes here, I did ask people if they had questions, but I haven't seen any questions come in. Um, so tying it back, one of the things that you've said repeatedly across, uh, while, while you're always sharing, while you're sharing about your research, um, is this the neuro exercise. That seems like a pretty big takeaway like a really great takeaway for what, whether we're at work or at home, mm -hmm. to have this idea um, of neuro exercise and that this can, you know, if we engage in that in some way, that that can really help help our um, re receptivity and help. Well, um, help our resources. Work. Yeah, we're help us be more resourceful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually go back to where the ideas came from. Okay from the teenager, when I was a teenager. So, I mean, we, we, we do things, we deconstruct them when we're older. We, we, I was a clarinetist. Uh -huh. Now, as an adult, I, I, I was actually, well, my teacher was a solo clarinetist with Tuscanini when, uh, uh -huh. I, 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 had a, I, I was a good clarinetist, but I stopped. But the important point was I, I practiced and I understood about practicing and what playing the clarinet was. It was a total neural exercise, but it was a neural exercise that overlapped with another neural exercise that we know as pranayama yoga. It was all about <laughs> breath and the facial muscles. Uh -huh. okay? uh -huh. Like singing is another one. Yeah. So we start looking at their different ways in which we can recruit these systems. So with, with playing a clarinet, it was breath, and exhalation was important because that's when the vagal activity is strongest. Mm -hmm. It was controlling all the striated muscles of the face for embouchure, and it was listening. So mm -hmm. all these things were going on. 
Okay? And that's, in a sense, what goes on with other forms, whether we sing or we do pranayama yoga. But playing the clarinet more like singing is usually done in a social setting. So you play and then you social reference. You make mm -hmm. eye contact. You, pl you play your instrument. You make eye contact. You can see some of these same features occurring if you observe people in drum circles. Mm -hmm. So people are in drum circles, they're playing, but they're trying to all play in the same rhythm, and they're always making eye contact with the person doing the leading or the other group. And what happens after the circle stops playing, when the people get up? They look at each other as if they are lifelong best friends, even though they never have seen each other before. They've right. gone through this engagement physiological state neural exercise so there are a lot of things we can do so when parents would contact me and say I, I want my kid to go into your research program the, my listening project I said well it's really not out there for, for the for the uh, public but why don't you have your your child uh, take singing lessons or why don't you play the recorder with your with your son so the two you're blowing uh, you know and why don't you sing together? He said, well, he doesn't sing well. That's not the issue. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you get the uh, breath going out and you get the social engagement. You develop the neural exercise. So as a clinician, you see anxious people and you see how they breathe. It's always moving upward in their chest. Yep. And when you play a musical instrument or you sing, the breath goes down. You fill it in. And that's calming. And that what's calming because it triggers more of the vagal efferent motor fibers to the heart. It downregulates sympathetics. So a lot of things that people do and they intuitively know are have a neurophysiological basis. And my, my really my concluding comment, I'll give you this little so when I give talks, uh, people always come up and they say, Oh, I really enjoyed your workshop. I learned so much. And I look at them and I say, Really? I said, didn't you merely uh, basically now believe that your intuitions were right? <laughs> because all I was doing and all I do is provide people with a neurophysiological understanding that, that their intuitions are correct, mm -hmm. their neuroception is accurate. That's a, that's a really lovely, lovely thing note to end on. And yet, you know, it's been so important. Um, Steve, for the field, to have that validity, that understanding, uh, to see that scientific research that says, that confirms that, you yeah. know, so that we can really be changing the way we interact as a society and, and privileging who we are, what we need as human beings so that we can make the world a, a safer place. Yeah, I totally agree. I think this is all about making the world a safer place. I agree. So thank you so much for your time, for your dedication across your career. And I'm really excited to hear, learn more about um, the other side of it, the receptivity in the <laughs> ear, and uh, following, continuing to follow your work. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Porges, for being oh, with me. Thank you very much. Nice being with you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for being here.